Welcome to Dark Corner's James Bond Posterathon, a gallop through the posters of the greatest action adventure movie franchise of all time in chronological order, taking in the studs and duds of the series' 58 year history. So, pay attention, 007, we've got a lot to get through. Given that this is the first film and that no one knew for sure if there'd be a second, let alone guess at the series longevity, this is an amazingly confident poster. Who the hell is this guy staring cockily out at us, daring us not to envy his life or watch his movie? It's also extraordinary how quickly the series found its basic touchstones. The self-assuredness of Bond, the handgun casually held, and of course, the parade of women in various stages of undress. Bond doesn't need to look at them, he knows they'll be there, waiting for him. Most telling is Dr. No himself. Not even fully on the poster for the movie named after him. He's an afterthought, he doesn't matter. You know who does matter? Bond. James Bond. With Bond, you've got to lean into the legend, and this is a legendary way to start the series. There's no way they could have known how perfect it was, but think about this. If you change the faces, is there a Bond film this image wouldn't work for? The success of Dr. No guaranteed a second film in the franchise, and the success of Sean Connery in the role guaranteed him a more prominent position on the poster. The poster for From Russia With Love is strong, stylish, and oozes confidence. The pastel colors give it a different aesthetic to the more familiar gloss, and the sketchy style enhances the fact that this is a rare Bond film that is actually a spy film, particularly in the depiction of Russia in the background, reached by a long train line, making the country seem like a whole other world. Vital though all those elements are to the film, what really sets the poster apart is that this is the sexiest Bond poster. It doesn't have the skin count of Moonraker or the leery excesses of You Only Live Twice. Its sexuality is exotic, violent, and above all, sultry. Daniela Bianchi practically spilling out of a gauzy gown that is barely even there, looking not at Bond, but out at us. Bond films would become more explicit in the future, but this was made at a time when every film was pushing the boundaries of what was allowed just that little bit further. And while we've trespassed far beyond those boundaries now, the poster retains that air of the forbidden. From the girls to the gun to the distant Russia, this is a world Bond is privy to that we are not. And the film is gonna give us a glimpse. Although many of the tropes now irrevocably associated with Bond were not yet in place with this, only his third film, Goldfinger has become recognised as the quintessential Bond movie. Partly because of that theme, but also because of a single image. A dead, naked girl painted in gold. That combination of sex, death, opulence, touched by the ludicrous and yet still macabre, is Bond. But the poster sort of isn't. Rather than taking a cue from the posters for From Russia With Love and Doctor No, the designer has gone in a completely different direction and delivered the darkest Bond poster until Daniel Craig. More importantly, look at the central couple. Yes, there's a Bond girl, but she's fully clothed. Yes, Bond has a gun, but it's not threatening or casual, it's defensive. There may be a ghost of a smile on his face, but he's certainly not smug. I'd say there was a hint of anxiety. This isn't Bond hitting on a girl, this is him protecting one, with the looming gold reminder in the background of what fate she might face, and no action scenes pasted around it to dilute the impact of this central image. At this point in the franchise, Bond could still have gone anywhere and been anything. This now feels like a look at the road not taken. A Bond shorn of confident swagger, of explosions, bikinis and garish colour. 
It's not that we're not happy with the Bond franchise we got, but it's fascinating to look at the one we could have had. This is not the definitive Bond poster, but it's something that none of the other Bond posters are. It's unique. However iconic Dr. No is, James Bond as a recognisable franchise did not arrive fully formed. The familiar tropes arrive over the years, slowly, some arriving, vanishing, then coming back again. The same is true of the posters and Thunderball represents a turning point. This is the first of the explosive posters that would dominate for the next two and a half decades. It's arguably here that Bond becomes more of an action hero than a spy, and while this is unlikely to be anyone's favourite, there's no denying its impact. You'd be forgiven for thinking the movie was in 3D. Everything is coming out at us. Twin explosions, missiles, harpoons, sharks, boats, and of course Bond himself, showcasing that jetpack that plays such a negligible role in the movie. In fact, I'm not sure this vital, action-packed image reflects the movie at all, but as an image, it is perfectly composed, everything in balance, proving the power of the painted poster splashed across that white background like it's crashing through it. Yes, look up, look down, look out, James Bond does it everywhere is a pretty awful tagline, but this set the template for future posters, and though many of them did flash better, this is where Bond's obsession with girls, gadgets, guns and explosions really starts. Though everyone has their personal favourite Bond, the general consensus is that Sean Connery wore it best. The actor in whom the spy's combination of thuggish brutality and suave elegance was best balanced. Mr. Smith and Weston, and you've had your six. While all the films aren't classics, no one else has equaled that opening run of Dr. No from Russia with Love and Goldfinger. With all this in his corner, it's good to take him down a peg from time to time. I was gonna say, I don't know what they were thinking, but I kind of do. It's not just the bevy of oriental beauties posed seductively around Bond, it's Connery himself cocking a very Roger Moore-ish eyebrow as if to say, I'm doing them all later. There's a vague feeling that the girl on the end holding a gun has been added just to remind us this is an action film and not softcore porn. Admittedly, there is a smaller secondary image of Bond, but even in this he's undermined by wearing a silly hat. Of course, this wasn't the only poster design, but to be honest, shouldn't he be flying that thing rather than striking a pose? God alone knows what's going on here. Bond has always existed in a heightened world, but this feels like an open admission that things were just starting to get a bit silly, and while in the future the franchise would learn to harness that, this is still too close to the more serious spy films of the early years, and I just don't think they knew how to market it, and so fell back on the oldest rule, sex sells. Much has been said about George Lazenby's debut stroke swan song as Bond, and the revisionist view is more positive than the reception he got at the time. Great theme song, great action sequences, a genuinely emotional love story, the failure of which meant that Bond didn't get another for the next 37 years. Looked at like that, it's tough to understand what went wrong. Then you watch it. And actually, it's still tough to understand what went wrong. It's nothing specific. Everything is just a bit off. This never happened to the other fella. Which brings us to the poster. Lazenby is in a standard Bond pose, but mid-air on skis. But look behind him. Diana Rigg looks like she's in mid-air on skis, her body twisted to keep her balance. By contrast, Bond looks ridiculous. His feet are together, but his knees are a mile apart. He looks more like our man Flint than our man Bond. Actually, more like Austin Powers, like he's going to crash into something. It's supposed to make him look cool, a man in command no matter the situation. But it's just a symptom of the frantic need to make this change work. Then there is the background. 
Leaving aside the fact that the most dangerous supervillain in the world has apparently joined the Swiss bobsleigh team, and supervillains shouldn't be doing their own dirty work, there's five helicopters and at least 50 people all shooting at Bond and apparently missing since he's smiling. It's too much. It's everything we want from Bond, but with the unmistakable stink of desperation. The failure of George Lazenby's rebooted Bond left Studio United Artists so desperate to get Connery back that they paid up the actor's one and a quarter million asking price. But, as the poster demonstrates, some of the OTT silliness that had inflected the last film was back with a vengeance. Diamonds Are Forever is Bond at its brightest, gaudiest and campest. All the now familiar elements are there, the tuxedoed Bond, flanked by scantily clad girls and backed by explosions. The diamonds of the title are there in the glittering satellite and are scattered by the girl on the right, who stares at them as if forced to choose between them and Bond, a girl's real best friend. We can't ignore the fact that Bond is standing or possibly straddling the weirdly magnified and elongated pincer of a moon buggy. Actually, is he sitting on Tiffany Case's lap? That's weird. But it's fine. In some ways, it's like the film itself. Nothing special, but it's not trying to be. It's a safe pair of hands to get us to the next. The other thing that strikes me about this poster is it has more in common with the posters of the Moore era. But, again, like on Her Majesty's Secret Service, everything's just not quite right. It feels unbalanced, particularly when compared with the perfectly composed images of Live and Let Die or The Man with the Golden Gun. It feels like a first draft. Let's just put everything on there, we'll get it right later. Perhaps the best thing to do with this poster is put it alongside Dr. No and marvel at how much, not the posters, but the franchise itself has changed, all except for Connery's poised super spy. And that's the essence of Bond, an unchanging point in an uncontrollable world. Although, of course, at this point, things were about to change. After the fiasco of On Her Majesty's Secret Service and Sean Connery's Never Again performance in Diamonds Are Forever, producers Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman knew they only had one more chance to introduce a new Bond. They threw everything at the film. And at the poster. This is the most in-your-face, overblown, fanboy-baiting Bond poster of them all, and it's wonderful. From an aesthetic point of view, the spread cards are genius, affording great opportunities for introducing characters and themes, but this poster isn't taking any chances. It screams, there must be something here you like. There's no less than four speedboats, three crashed cars, and a giant alligator that I have to say I don't remember from the film. He's a crop. Got over careless with him some time back and he took my whole arm off. Well done, Albert. There's Baron Samady rising from fire, laughing at us. And four surprisingly diverse Bond girls, a stripper type with a feather boa, one with a snake wrapped around her holding a voodoo doll, and the first black Bond girl ever to make it onto the poster. But for all that this is selling you on the hype and the spectacle, there's no mistaking the focus. With his head haloed by an explosion and two sharks sneaking up behind him, Roger Moore is unfazed. The image of Bond fixing us with a steely-eyed stare as a scantily clad girl perches astride his enormous weapon. If the posters of the last few films have been a bit iffy, this one recaptures the fun, the fire and the spirit of Bond, as if to say, Sean who? In many ways, the poster for The Man with the Golden Gun picks up the pattern established by Live and Let Die. A flashy, throw-everything-at-the-wall image fanned out in a well-composed splash of colour about Roger Moore's posed and poised 007. 
There's a leaping car, an explosion, a great big gun, a significantly smaller gun in the hands of a memorable henchman. Two Bond girls wearing some of the smallest bikinis ever to grace a movie poster. And in the centre, a quintet of vividly coloured karate fighters. But all that is to ignore the elephant in the room. The golden gun of the title is there, front and centre, being loaded by an unseen assailant with a bullet that literally has Bond's number on it. Bond posters very seldom say much about plot because, frankly, there isn't always a lot to say and what there is can be quite complex. How would you sum up Dr No's plans for world domination in a single image? And how would that image differ from the one that sums up Blofeld's? But, Despite some more ambitious schemes, as far as we're concerned, Scaramanga's goal is to kill Bond. And that couldn't be clearer. The other thing to love about this poster is that Scaramanga was played by Dracula himself, Christopher Lee, a big name signing for the bad guy that didn't often happen back then. But he's not on the poster. It would have been so easy to have Moore and Lee facing off, but this puts the hero on the back foot before the movie's even started and retains an air of mystery about the bad guy. Except, of course, that's him with his other gun in a small secondary image to the side. Which is a pity, but it's a small quibble in a poster that shows you can adhere to the formula. You can go big and bang with the guns and the girls and the gadgets and still do something original and, in this case, quite pertinent to the story. Everybody has their personal favourite Bond, but whatever your opinion on that contentious issue, Roger Moore was the right man at the right time. By the end of the Connery era, the emphasis in the films had shifted to scale, and while Connery nailed the focused spy, Moore owned the widescreen adventure. The posters bridging these eras had become colourful explosions of girls, guns, gadgets, and pretty much everything else they could fit in the space. The spy who loved me sought to reinvent this. There's still a lot going on, but the space is dominated by the huge thrusting submarine, even to the extent that it's pushing 007 out of the way, suggesting that perhaps this is something too big for James Bond to handle. Speaking of which, there's only one girl on the poster. The only other time that had happened before, he married her. This one woman is enough for Bond placed almost on an equal footing with him, the first time this had happened in the franchise, but not the last. You can also read it as saying that Bond has the girl, the bad guy is clearly compensating for something. This still has scale, but rather than accumulated scale, this and this and this and this, it just says this. This was Moore's third outing as the spy, and for the first time, the poster reflects complete confidence in Connery's replacement. There's no need to oversell it. Roger Moore is James Bond. Even if that looks nothing like him. With The Spy Who Loved Me, Roger Moore had scored a major hit, and everyone involved rallied round to repeat that success in the most literal way possible only bigger. And what's bigger than space? To the poster designer's credit, he hasn't just taken the poster from The Spy Who Loved Me and put it in space, although Lois Charles's pose is very similar to that of Barbara Bach. But the similarities are still there. Richard Keel's jaws looms noticeably, as if to say, you liked me in the last film, didn't you? Overshadowing the actual bad guy. But who remembers him? The opening shuttle in the background recalls the submarine swallowing ship in the last film, and 007 is once again dwarfed by the vastness of his surroundings. Also, this is a poster that knows how to use black. We got used to Bond posters being explosions of colour, but this manages to retain the same aesthetic, but with a much reduced palette. They also recognised that human skin tone is a great contrast with black, exploited more successfully in this secondary poster. Hard to avoid the impression that a producer somewhere said, can we make it clear, 
just because it's set in space doesn't mean we'll be giving the girls sensible clothes. In the end, Moonraker paid the price for simultaneously having too much and too little imagination and for letting scale overwhelm sense. But it's a credit to the poster that it makes a faintly ridiculous film seem damn near plausible. While Connery has the most impressive Bond filmography, surely Roger Moore takes the poster crown. Yes, they are the most garish, the most over the top, and occasionally the most camp, but they are memorable. They're more than adverts for the films, they're little works of art in themselves, and while there are many great ones, there is one that really stands out. The poster for For Your Eyes Only is one of a handful of Bond posters that seem quintessential. Aren't all Bond posters this one? This is what we think of when we think Bond poster, this perfect representation of sex and violence flanked by action, by land, by air, on the water and under it. There's a skier being pursued by motorcyclists, for goodness sake. Would it be cool today? Probably not, but you work in the era you work in, and this isn't a great poster because that's quite a lot of backside on display. It's a great poster because it's perfectly composed. The blue wash of the background is punctuated by little flashes of yellow. The car, the helicopter, the lights on the submarine, even the sniper's hair. There is a slight haziness, almost an unfinished quality to the painting, except in the central triangle, making Bond stand out even further, stark, angular, almost symbolic. But my favourite thing about this poster... All right, my second favourite thing about this poster is that the designer seems to have decided to tell a little story. Bond seems to be in the act of spinning around to fire, but Look at the angle of his gun. He's going to miss. So, did she startle him and he turned around, then realised that the crossbow was lowered? Is she holding a gun in her other hand, which we pointedly can't see? These little details you only take in subliminally when you walk past the poster, but they still matter. By the time of Octopussy, Roger Moore's tenure as Bond had well and truly jumped the shark and the actor was looking a little old for a role that refused to acknowledge the passage of time. In the film, the blend of sex, action and wry humour that had defined the franchise was looking decidedly wobbly, but the poster actually kind of nails it. On the one hand, this is kind of the only way to deal with that title. On the other, it's a great idea, distilling the essence of Bond not into one image, but into one woman. Maud Adams' octopusy is a woman who can cater to all Bond's needs, even if she needs eight arms to do it. Obviously she's caressing him, and what she's doing to that silencer probably bears a second look, but she's also adjusting a button on that impeccably tailored suit and straightening his tie. She holds the requisite drink. More importantly, she is a Bond woman of dimension, a challenge. The Fabergé egg is held away from Bond, keeping it out of his grasp. In one of her left hands, she holds a knife in unmistakable threat. While nodding to the action-adventure in the side images and keeping the focus on Bond, who has seldom looked stronger resisting her blandishments, this poster presents the title character as an enigma. Whose side is she on? What are her motives? Can she be trusted? Frankly, this poster does a better job of making Octopussy a fascinating character than the film did. By the time of A View to a Kill, Roger Moore was in his late 50s and the films had lost a lot of their edge. Perhaps it was in an attempt to recapture some of that edge that the poster for A View to a Kill placed the villain on an almost equal footing with Bond, putting them back to back, flip sides of the same coin, 007 and his evil reflect. I'm not sure we got the right poster. In fairness, Roberts is standing in the same posture, her hands are in the same pose. 
Grace Jones isn't wearing boots like that, but they would certainly fit in with her general ensemble. Is it possible the poster designer for Pretty Woman saw this and thought, I can use that? As a Bond poster, this is a much starker image than most of Roger Moore's, focusing on the physical and sexual battle between Bond and Jones's Mayday that plays a relatively insignificant role in the movie, but makes for an arresting image. While Bond posters had put women on a roughly equal footing before, notably in The Spy Who Loved Me, this is different. The image highlights Mayday's physical strength. The fact that she doesn't have a weapon doesn't make her seem weak. It makes her seem like she doesn't need one. This isn't a woman like Octopussy, who represents a vague threat, surreptitious and seductive. Or like Agent Triple X, who works for the other side. The threat that Mayday represents is she can very obviously kick his ass. That's not just a first for Bond posters, it's an only, and a fitting end to Roger Moore's time as Bond. Timothy Dalton's reinvention of the character as younger, more virile and less comical was a good idea that would work better for other actors. But one thing about The Living Daylights that worked better than anyone could have expected was the poster. How is it possible that in all those years no one thought to use the opening iris? How is it possible we had decades of static bonds when we could have had this lithe, active figure? This seems like the definitive Bond poster, and yet it's the only one to use this image, and it does use it. The typical maelstrom of girls and guns, fire and fury, is drawn into a whirlpool with Bond at its centre, not in the eye, but breaking out of it. Daniel Craig would use a similar, though starker, image for Skyfall, but this is more effective at harnessing the whole Bond ethos. It's also worth noting that this would be the last hurrah of the painted Bond poster. From here on in, it would be photoshopped, airbrushed and somewhat soulless. But what a way to go out. Forget the film it's attached to, everyone else did. There's a good case to be made that this is the best Bond poster, the one that best encapsulates the franchise and catches the essence of Bond and restores that essence after the excesses of some of the later Moore films. It's the definitive Bond poster and yet manages to be that with a new idea. Something everyone probably thought they must have done that before. I doubt it's his biggest regret in playing the character, but Timothy Dalton's brief tenure as the super spy saw him become the first to suffer the indignities of the photoshopped poster era. Gone were the imaginative explosions of style and colour of the past, replaced with this. It's tough to know what to hate most about this. The pouty Bond girls, the random iguana, the horrible mat line between the bad guy's head and the plane wing, or the Blue Lagoon background that seems to have come from an 80s romantic TV comedy destined for an afternoon slot on Channel 5. Also, please note the absence of punctuation in the tagline, contributing to the overall ethos of who cares. But if I had to pick one thing, I'd go with the 007 branding, added either to fill up space or because someone took one look at it and thought, no one's going to believe this is Bond. Better make it clearer. And what's this mass of black on the left-hand side? Is it supposed to be Bond coming out of the darkness? Because what it looks like is the designer losing interest. This is a poster that reflects the Bond era from which it came, an era when no one thought the character had anything left to say. At least they were wrong. Even today, as the gaps between films lengthen, the six years between Dalton's last Bond and Brosnan's first feels like a long time, and many thought the franchise would end with License to Kill. GoldenEye arrived on a wave of expectation, but also riding a wave of goodwill. People wanted it to be good. And it is. It's a strong film with strong acting and strong set pieces. It just doesn't linger in the mind. And the same can be said of the poster, although perhaps unfairly. Familiar as it seems now, partly because the Brosnan era posters follow a standardised formula, 
This was a reinvention, taking some of the apocalyptic awfulness of the License to Kill poster, the Running Man, the Fire, the Back to Back Girls, the 007 branding, and channeling it into something darker, better, edgier. It has style, it has class, it has a very fine tagline that reminds us that while he's been away, Bond is still number one. And there's no denying that Brosnan looks the part, not just as Bond, but as this Bond, modern yet dangerous. When you look at the films that precede it, that six years suddenly seems like a really short time. This was a complete reinvention, the most thorough that Bond had ever had. And this poster was our first look at it. Viewed with hindsight, it may seem disappointingly nothing special, but at the time, it wasn't far short of a revolution. We've already touched on the problems of talking about the Brosnan era. The posters all look the same. Good girl, bad girl, Bond, bad guy in the background, some stuff. That's the formula. The screens are a nice touch, referring to the film's content, and Michel Yeoh's dress makes a nice colour contrast. Although I don't think dressing Terry Hatcher to match the screens was a good call. Jonathan Price looks suitably menacing and making him part of his own greyly uniform media suggests insurmountable odds. But the car and bike crashing towards us just looked like an afterthought, hastily pasted in after someone said, isn't this an action film? But that's not the real problem. The real problem is that this isn't a poster that's even trying to be about the film. It's about a marketing strategy. Look at it. Not a hair out of place. None of the rawness of Connery or the humour of Moore. This is a film in which Brosnan motorcycles along a roof handcuffed to Michel Yeoh. But there's no room for anything that chaotic on this poster. This is always a bad thing, but in Tomorrow Never Dies, it's worse because the big bad here is media. And when you look at this image, Bond doesn't seem to be the antidote to it. He looks like he's part of it. The glossy, bland posters of the Brosnan era are all a bit unmemorable and a bit uninspired, but it's only the world is not enough that slips into embarrassing. First impressions aren't actually that bad. True, the good girl, bad girl, Bond, bad guy looming in the background motif is present and correct, but Bond is standing in the middle of a tornado of images. Look closer and you'll see the world is actually on fire. Cool, right? But look again and you'll see those other images are all screen grabs from the movie itself. Does it matter? Most of the painted images of the past were based on scenes from the movies. But those pictures seem to leap off the sheet. They seem to have been composed by someone who had spent time creating an overall image. These are just some shots that have been put in. They're not even that well chosen, could have been anything. It's lazy. And it's another sign that by this point, the only person who really cared about the Brosnan and Bond films was Pierce Brosnan himself. There are many Bond fans, myself included, who consider Pierce Brosnan to be the best James Bond we never had. While his first two films are enjoyable entries in the canon, overall Brosnan, who was keen to move the character on long before the Craig era reboot, was let down by writers and by the producers increasing desperation to cling to a failing formula. No, I'm 007. In terms of posters, the designers had settled on a standard formula. Good girl, bad girl, Bond, surrounded by the requisite flash. And it's interesting to note that while this kind of worked when it was painted, photoshopping really killed it. The main poster for Die Another Day is no different, except that it promotes Halle Berry significantly above Rosamund Pike owing to her star status. But we've chosen to look at the teaser. Obviously this speaks to the film's setting and content, but there's a nice double meaning too. Initially it looks as if the gun is being defrosted, but it's smoking, which means it's been fired. So is the hot gun itself melting the ice? symbolising how Bond will dispel evil. But this is an image that actually works better in retrospect. Now it feels like a requiem to the Brosnan era. Bond had been on ice. Brosnan 
kept the character alive and the franchise profitable until someone else was able to pick up that smoking gun. I like to think that when the artist was given the job of designing a new Bond poster for a new Bond and a new era, they were excited by the possibilities and by the chance to add their distinctive voice to a rich canon that has had a major influence on poster design in general. I really hope their first draft was great and did what the movie did to pay homage to the classics while reinventing it for a modern audience. And then a subcommittee descended and said, no, no, we want the front cover of GQ magazine. Starting with our first glimpse of Daniel Craig as Bond, he's disheveled. Great, down with that. This is the Jason Bourne Bond, the Bond who's been roughed up except for his face, his hands, his hair and his clothes. Everything is clean, airbrushed to perfection. It looks like someone's ironed a crease in his jacket sleeve. Having said, make it look like he's been in a fight, they then said, but not dirty. And then there's his expression. He's supposed to look tough, but he just looks stoned. And I'm not having a go at Daniel Craig's acting here. Any expression he might have had has once again fallen prey to Photoshop. How did the rest of the design conversation go? Can we use the opening iris? Absolutely. We can use it to show the basic elements of Bond. Cool vehicles, pretty girls, an explosion. Uh, that still leaves two sections behind him. Yeah, just leave them blank. I don't think anyone will notice. You can say that it sounds like I have a problem with modern poster design in general, and you wouldn't be wrong, but it's more noticeable in Bond because there is the legacy we know they can do better. Partly because fans keep on making better posters. This or the fashion shoot? No contest. For all the reinventions of the Craig era Bond, the posters are one area where the glory days of the past remain resolutely unrecaptured. Prevailing wisdom remains that what you need to sell a movie is a big glossy picture of the star and any suggestion that the film might have an individuality or, God forbid, personality of its own has to be airbrushed out. The posters for the Craig era Bonds line up in a glossy grey procession that highlights the lack of humour in the modern franchise but does little else. The one for Quantum of Solace is at least interesting. At first glance, it seems to do little more than confirm that Daniel Craig is indeed still playing Bond and hasn't he got a nice watch? I wonder if they're sponsoring us. It's even blanker and greyer than the rest of his posters, with the large empty space behind him suggesting that even the poster designer didn't actually know what the film was about, something they had in common with everyone who watched it. With the eye of charity, we could say that this is Bond emerging from his personal wilderness, a phoenix rising from that scorched earth. Or you could just note he has a much bigger gun than usual. What makes it interesting is that this image actually comes from the end of Casino Royale. This is the first and so far only Bond poster to make reference to continuity, to say unmistakably that this is not just the next James Bond, this is a sequel. It is perhaps the only bold decision made by a James Bond poster designer since the 1980s. Skyfall is generally agreed to be the best of the Daniel Craig Bond films thus far, marrying the post-Jason Bourne edge with golden era set pieces and knowing nods to the back catalogue. Then there's the poster. If you take away the title, this could be for any Daniel Craig Bond. I like the fact that they're using the opening gun barrel, a surprising rarity in Bond poster design, and the fact that he's inside it may hint that he's the target in this movie, the one on the run, or it might be a reference to the end of the pre-title sequence. But I just don't think it is. I think it's a Bond poster. And you might say, why not? We all know what happens in a Bond film anyway. Bond. James Bond. But that hits to the very foundation of the franchise. One of the things that makes it fun is seeing how they can twist that basic formula. How different can the bad guys be? How can the plans change? And 
that applies to the posters too. The stern monochrome is very in keeping with the seriousness of the modern Bond, but is there a danger that the Daniel Craig era versus the rest of the Bonds just becomes like DC versus Marvel and people start saying, well, seriousness is all very well, but does anyone remember when these films used to be fun? It sounds like I'm down on the poster, and I suppose I am, but that's because I remember really enjoying Skyfall. For me, this doesn't capture it. It doesn't really capture anything. There were a number of posters for Spectre, many of them focusing on Bond himself, gun and tie intact, with the inevitable beautiful girl. Stuff we'd recognise right back from Dr. No, albeit in a very different style. But the one we've chosen to look at is the most powerful, the simplest, and the one which shows how far Bond has come. The central image can be interpreted in many different ways. A reference to that famous opening, an echo of the human eye, a reflection of Bond's fractured psyche, and of course, a crude, violent representation of the spectre octopus. But the real force of the poster is that it can say all these things in an instant, because now we know Bond. If the Dr. No poster was a 5,000 word introduction, this is a picture that speaks a thousand words. It's a sharp and quite deliberate contrast to the busier posters of the Connery and Moore eras, but without them, you don't get to this. A poster that can say so much with a single image, a word, and that number. It almost makes up for that Sam Smith theme song, but not quite. Nothing will ever forgive that. And so we finally arrive at No Time to Die. And apparently there was no time to design the poster. So we'll just use a picture from the last magazine photo shoot Daniel Craig did, radiating an aura of no time for this, I'm needed on the set of Knives Out, just give me the check. Also, no time to design the font, so we'll just use something from a roughly comparable source. Fortunately, we also get... No time to get into costume. No time to find a less revealing dress, so we'll just put the M in the way. No time to find out why I've been dressed as a nun. No time to find you your own pair of trousers, so you can just borrow bonds. I've got no time for this. And there the story ends. For now. Will we ever see a return to the colourful Bond? The tongue-in-cheek Bond? The weirdly oversexed Bond? Will any poster ever sum up the spy as well as the living daylights, or for your eyes only? Will the next Bond herald another reinvention, and what could that mean for the poster art? We don't have answers to any of these questions. The only thing we can be reasonably sure of is that James Bond will return. Thanks for watching. And special thanks to our Patreon supporters, without whose generosity we would not be able to make these more ambitious videos. Tell us your favourite Bond films, posters, actors in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe.